Okay. It says the Hangout on air is live, but I don't believe it because there's the live button right there. Now we're live. There's always a little bit of a stutter. Um, welcome, everybody. We're back. It's been a hiatus. I'm sorry about that. Um, but with us today is Steam developer Jesse De uh, Beach. I can't even believe I messed that up. Jesse Beach, welcome to the show. Hi, Chris. Drupal and coffee in the morning. I should have mentioned that before. Welcome. Anyways. Let's say, wait. Yes, we got the coffees. And my head sized mug. It's very important. I, I was just thinking that it looked bigger because it was closer to the camera, but it's no, actually. No, it's actually behind my head. It's <laughs> just, just one head size. Yeah. Fill your head with knowledge, fill your, fill your head with coffee. Yeah. Almost the same thing. Copy by the hog's head. <laughs> so we are gathered here today to talk about the Drupals. Um, and it's been an exciting uh, couple of weeks um, if you're following the, the commit log like, like I obsessively do. Um, it, se it, it seems to me, I, I just, just this is my general impression of like where we are right now. There's so many things that are like code cleanup issues. We're fixing this kind of performance kind of issues. It seems like we're, you know, getting really close to getting a beta out. Um, and, and that's pretty exciting to see. Um, but before we get into all of that, um, to all of our Google Plus visitors and people uh, coming in to uh, watching this show, finding this show on YouTube or such, um, we gather to get together uh, once a week on Wednesdays to meet with somebody from the Drupal community and to find out about what's going on um, with with them and, and what they're doing. Um, and we're trying to take a tour through all the different parts of Drupal. Um, the reason uh, why uh, Jesse Beach is a great person to talk to today is because um, she's leading a lot of sprints um, for uh, the the accessibility of Drupal, and um, it would be great to get her impressions of um, how that effort is going and where we are with that. Um, Jesse, could you could you frame the discussion of why accessibility is important for a content management system? I think it's very simply that a content management system is an enabler. It allows someone to, you know, express information. And if that information, you know, if that person is unable because of the system to to input that information or to um, consume that information, then that content management system has failed. And we can't pick and choose the people who get to use this system. It, it just simply has to be everybody. That's right. And um, it, accessibility um, is is not only you know important in order to meet making sure that your system meets the needs of all of its users, but it's also just good design. If you're building uh, your your system so that I mean it's it it's completely inaccessible, so that it can't even be be used for for people who you know may not be able to see the the site uh, as so, so they, they, they can't like click on all the things. And maybe your design is is doing too much. Maybe it's maybe there's something about your design that it fundamentally breaks. Yeah, and I think we tend to use the word usability to encompass accessibility, especially for you know the majority of our users. Accessibility is something that is just assumed, and then we're just talking about making that that accessible thing more usable. Uh, but as soon as you know your usability breaks so much that it becomes inaccessible, then you've uh, you put a roadblock in front of, of everybody. You know, uh, a link that you can't click. What was a good example the other day? I was trying to buy contact lenses. If you follow me on Twitter, you might have seen that saga. And someone had coded the JavaScript to only allow me to type in one character in the field for the credit card number, and that required me to go into the HTML and hack around a bit to get around that. And that wasn't a usability issue. That was an accessibility issue. I physically couldn't 
input the information I needed to input, given the, you know, the devices I had uh, available. So, you know, when I think about accessibility, I think about it as the baseline for starting usability. And for the most part, our tools make uh, a visual keyboard, mouse, screen experience accessible from the get-go, and then we're just trying to make that better. But it is definitely possible to dip below that level of usability for, um, you know, for the majority of your users and make it simply inaccessible. Right. I, I think one of the, the large kind of benefits that, that happens kind of in the background. You never really see this, but um, the, the focus on accessibility puts focus on our, our, what, what we're building, you know, like a, a system for making a web page. It focuses on making things better one component at a time um, and, and making sure that the system isn't just, you know, the spewage of HTML, that it's, it's a series of reusable components you know, mm -hmm. uh, because as you're making a, a web product, it, it would be really great if you could reuse it, solutions and not have to redo one-off solutions all over the place. Um, but it, you know, the, just that focus on having having a good system so that you don't have to solve the problem a hundred times, but you're just solving it a handful of times and having that be reflected throughout the entire system um, has been a thing that I think that has really helped uh, Drupal in this in this development cycle. Um. Yeah, it, we're solving some fairly complex interaction problems, and you, know, you don't you don't solve any of those problems in the first try. They take time, and a system like Drupal is just baking those good decisions and those um, those components that prove themselves over time into this package that we all get to, to reuse. And yeah, that's why I work on it. I would rather see my efforts focused on usability extended to a million websites than you know, to build a repo on GitHub and then hope that someone comes around and happens to integrate it into their, their system. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, the focus on um, how these components, the, the, the entire system, um, uses or, or implements the accessibility has also been kind of interesting to me. Like in this cycle, there's a lot of focus on having um, HTML5 fields and components and being able to utilize um, all of the all of the parts of the HTML spec that allows us to have good accessibility, like like the ARIA um, um, attributes that you can put on. Um, fields, but I'm I'm sure you've no, know far more about that than I. I was just like, could could you talk a little bit about what's what's different in this development cycle that that we didn't do in previous cycles? Well, first off, I think the tools have gotten better. So something like Aria didn't really exist in a mature way during the Triple Seven development cycle. It was still being um, written. Uh, developed as a specification. The screen readers themselves have gotten better over time, and the availability of um, user agents, uh, you know, accessible user agents that are free and, and somewhat, I wouldn't say open source, but just available, more readily available, especially on um, mobile devices, has become a, a sort of a game changer in that way. From a community perspective, I feel that we just have more experts in this cycle, folks who are willing to do evaluations, who are willing to do the development, who are willing to take a stand and say that we have to address accessibility in order to introduce a feature, or at least to follow up if we've made a promise that we will you know, address it in the future. Yeah, it's a gate. Exactly. So uh, for folks who don't know, we have a series of gates that define the parameters or the conditions upon which we're going to introduce a new behavior or feature into Drupal. And one of them is that that feature has to be accessible. And everything's a negotiation. So sometimes we will open a critical or a major issue in order to get a feature in to unblock you know, downstream development. And that might put a gate on hold, but 
my experience has been we, we've come back to it. And that is a, just a trust issue. We, we have to be able to trust each other that if we say we're going to do work downstream, we're going to actually do it. And I've been really impressed that, that that's happened. Uh, and then the technologies have, have simply improved. Like you mentioned, we have better form inputs. Um, we have this thing called ARIA, which stands for uh, Accessible Rich Internet Applications. This is what I like to call semantic, um, our semantic application layer. So it allows us to specify things like the state of a, a button. We can say a button is pressed or not pressed. We can say um, something is disabled or not disabled. And we can do that you know, today with form elements. You can say a checkbox is checked. But you can't do that if you create a component out of a div that has to act like a checkbox for some reason. I don't know why you do that, but you could with Aria. Some, some, some uh, whatever kind of custom markup. And then, yeah, and then. Because the, the way of, the, of modern development is to just roll your own components without mm -hmm. necessarily having it be a strict HTML5 field. Yeah, and I think one of the really exciting developments that we'll see, you know, if, if I had to pre predict the next five years, is going to be introduction of Shadow DOM and allowing us to go in and create these composed components. That happens to be a a passion of mine as well. Oh, it does. Yeah. Tell me about that. I'm oh, um, got it. I, yeah, you know what? Uh, I had the opportunity to speak at the uh, the Drupal Camp Twin Cities, uh, largely about Shadow DOM. And the thing that kind of struck me about this technology is that for years we've had to wait for browser vendors to provide new things, new elements. You know, and I, I don't know what. The, you know, within the history of web development, there's all kinds of different vendors that have said, look, these are the components that you will use, you know, Cold Fusion, Microsoft, ASP.NET, they, they all do this kind of top-down approach of saying, look, these are the things you can use, and these are the only things, other than maybe if you wanted to spend years learning how to build your own things. But Shadow DOM and custom elements give the average web developer who you know, maybe they, maybe they only know HTML, JavaScript, and um, well, really just HTML, and JavaScript, um, to build your own web components, reusable web components that you can use within a website. Like if you wanted to create a Drupal block element, you could create the markup for that, put it into a file, and have that be included onto a page, and so you can reuse that just by having the tag say Drupal dash block. Um, so it's pretty exciting in that regard. I think what I'm looking forward to the most is introducing administration components into the front end team. We've struggled with that a lot because we have to style those components as if they were administration theme components, but they live in the same DOM as you know, the front end experience for an end user. So I'm, you know, what I'm looking forward to in, in five years is being able to port Drupal administration experience into Shadow DOM components. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah, a drop button would be a great... Uh, the, the Drupal 8 provides this button that is kind of like a drop-down list and a button at the same time. And uh, having a drop button be an element would be kind of like a no-brainer to mm -hmm. me. But clearly, that, that's a, a, re a thing that you would want to reuse in many different places. Yeah, and a, a very large content management system that has a theme layer component is perfectly poised to provide those sorts of components in the library. Yeah. Oh, wow. I'm, like, totally excited about, you know, five years from now in, in Drupal, what, 12? <laughs> yeah, I, oh, a while back, I was trying to explore what would be necessary in order to create some kind of an element that speaks to a custom REST service. Mm. Because now that Drupal 8 has a RESTful service in core, there are a ton of things that we could do for heavily data-driven components. Imagine having, like, a base data table. I mean, that's, like, one of the first things that ASP.NET provides is some kind of crazy grid or a table that is using some kind of back-end data service, you know? That would be great. You know, and, and it's, in some regard, all of those other frameworks that have been, tried this in the past using their own custom proprietary te technologies are a roadmap to all the, the crazy ideas that we could do using a standard 
a component that is hopefully going to be in every browser in five years' time. Yeah, just kind of the in the same way that Flash um, made us uh, love the rounded button. Maybe you know, Cold Fusion will will make us love the composed component. Um, you know, speaking about uh, user interface uh, improvements, um, you've actually been one of the, the, the team members of a very important uplifting initiative that Drupal has experienced called Spark. Um, and I still remember the feeling I had when I, I first heard about that there was going to be a major effort behind improving Drupal's user experience and that it was going to be under the Spark umbrella. And, um, uh, it, it, in my opinion, when, when I show regular users Drupal 8, they don't know, ever see, or ever care about all the, all the work we've done into improving the back-end systems and all the, the code improvements. What they love is the content creation page. Yeah, which was uh, one of the things that Spark was involved in but did not need. So that was an effort um, by Boyan, Lewis Neumann, uh, Ryan, so RY5N. I'm probably forgetting some people, and I super apologize for that, but those are the names that come to mind. Uh, and they did a phenomenal job with that. You know, it's redoing one of the most important forms in Drupal is not an easy effort. So kudos to, to that team for putting that together. They also love the, the responsive toolbar, which I think you, you're, the Spark team had, had much more involvement in. Yes, so that was one of our primary focuses within the Spark project. And, yeah, that was uh, not without controversy. I, you know, it's, it's hard to solve all the use cases, and there are some open issues still that would you know, bring back the prominence of the shortcuts which we kind of um, buried in, in a trade-off with, you know, pluggability. So I'm hoping that once we get the criticals behind us, we can go back and visit some of those. There's a lot of kind of tiny issues that need to be um, brought back to normals and majors on the toolbar. As with any major feature addition that, that is relatively new, it's, it's, I mean, these are, these are always things that, that evolve. Mm -hmm. but being able to say from the first day that a user uses a Drupal site that you'll still be able to navigate through the site even if you're using a mobile phone is pretty huge. Yeah, that's we just had to do it. Drupal had to have something like this. We couldn't have gone on with the toolbar we had in Drupal 7 in, in a mobile world. And it, it as, as with every iteration, you know, we it's, it's a process of, I like to think of it as, as like platform and applications. Like you, you have to listen to your audience and, and be able to continually iterate and improve. Um, it's, it, you can't ever just assume that what you have is going to be good enough. You know, you have to do the research. You have to actually talk to the people who are using the things and get their impression. Not just, not just like a platform developer's impression of like what they like. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That's that's my high horse. I, I, I like I like thinking about that. You know, the platform and platform developers and application developers are kind of like a cycle. The in order to find out what you want to make for your platform, you need to listen to your application developers and what they're using it for. Mm -hmm. you know? But and the application developers are listening to their users in order mm -hmm. to find out what kind of applications to make for them. So it's, it's a cycle, and sometimes it's good to just jump. <laughs> jump off, you know, not just listen to the application developers, but directly from the users. So if there are folks who consider themselves application developers and users watching this video, I think this is a great place to encourage participation in the queues that expresses need. I think a lot of times we get caught up in the mechanics of building the platform in the queues. And we would all benefit from 
use cases, insight, opinions about how this stuff is going to be used. And you know, when we get that, and it's not as frequent as I would, I was, I would want it to be, I feel like we respond to it and we make the, the platform better. So yeah, the, the issue queue is not always the friendliest place to go whenever you want to say, could you please make this a priority? Could you please, uh, you know, like not really just a bug that you found in the system, but submitting feature requests. Um, it's it's somewhat. I mean, it, it it has been intimidating for me in the past. Um, and I, I do a a lot of Drupal these days, but in the past, I I was just, you know, watching the project, championing its every success, but still trying to find a way to have a voice. Um, and I would I, I did that a few times. I went into the issue queue and I said, look, I think this is important. You should do this. And I didn't get a very good response. Yeah, I personally apologize for that. Um, I get very upset when folks respond negatively or harshly to comments and opinions in the issue queue. I do not think that is that is our culture. And when it pops up, you know, we're all responsible for correcting that behavior. Um, and, and not tossing the person who may have um, transgressed under the bus, but, but teaching everybody. You know, it's, it's very easy, I think, to devolve into a culture of sniping and uh, brinksmanship. And any project, I think, will end up there. But we all have to be guardians, I think, of civility uh, within Drupal. And more so than other projects I've been involved in, Drupal does that. Um, I, will, I will not say that we're ever perfect and we've reached a point of utopia, but we still have a majority of people who are striving to get there. And I should say that's been um, my experience as well, you know, um, that, that sometimes I'll get a negative response, but largely I get um, a, a very welcoming response. Um, ide new ideas even if they, you know, fundamentally opposed the current momentum of where we're going, are listened to. Mm -hmm. and, and we talk about them. We don't just dismiss them out of hand. Um, and, and when the uh, development cycle opens up, any crazy idea is welcome. Let's, yeah. talk about, let's talk about things that completely conflict with the norm and, and, and how we normally do things. Um, those, those ideas are welcome because it's, it's all good feedback. Mm -hmm. If somebody wants to re-implement Drupal in Perl, maybe that's a non-starter. But at least we'll, we'll talk about the relative merits of Perl and PHP. Yeah, it, we spend, so my team is not just a team of coders. So just to give a shout out, my team is uh, Wim Lears, Gabor Hyotzi, uh, Andy Byron, Kevin O'Leary. So we're sort of the, the core Spark team. And we spend a lot of time discussing the mood of the community. And I, I truly feel that part of my, my job as a Drupalist is making sure that that mood remains um, jovial and fun and inviting. You know, it, it can't just be all about the code. I don't think we'd have nearly as much participation if folks were just purely here for that cerebral experience of writing code, although that is you know, a big part of why I'm in Drupal. But there's plenty of other places you can do that. I, I would just like to champion that as well. I mean, for me, Drupal has never always been about the code. Um, if, you know, actually, the, the code that has always interested me has always been outside of Drupal. You know, I'm actually a .NET developer. <laughs> there's not that much crossover. I mean, there, there's more than you think. But there's, there's not an incredible amount of a crossover. Um, but I've always wanted to stay involved in Drupal because of the welcoming nature of the community. You know, my very first Drupal experience after many, many years of trying to get to a Drupal event was the local Drupal camp. And Angie Byron happened to be there. That was the whole reason I wanted to go, <laughs> was to have the opportunity to shake her hand and say thank you. And it always just kind of, I, I tell the story a few times, but it, it strikes me that in, on that day, what she was most interested in was not, you know, receiving praise, it was finding out what I was doing. You know, just some random person at an event. You know, it's like, oh, I saw this issue you were on, and tell me more about that. That was, that was, really strikes me. Yeah, she's pretty cool. I like her a lot. 
I muted. Ha, huh, funny. Um, so uh, continuing the, uh, the talk about Spark, before we run out of time, um, is, are there plans for Spark 2.0? Is there do you do you have things lined up for what you would want to do next when when you have the time? We do. So we've been as a as a group and you know, talking with Dries and looking at the mood and the needs of the project. We have a couple of big items that we're going to focus on. I think what consistently bubbles to the top of our list is media. So helping uh, and assisting the teams that are currently working on that to get it to a point where we can improve the core media experience. There's already been you know, years and hundreds of person hours of work devoted to this. And whatever we can provide in addition to that to, to help you know, move it along, we'll do. We've talked about revamping the fields screen. So when you're adding fields to a content type, making that experience uh, a, a bit less Clunky. I, I hate to disparage it like that, but you know, well, it's you... it's really a screen that's targeted for database modelers or database developers yeah, rather than the average one. user. <laughs> you know, it's, it's it's like oh here's oh this is like a table and oh here I'm adding columns to it. Not really. That's not really what you're doing. Um, no, no. <laughs> and I've it just it to... kind of looks like that though. Yeah, and I've never understood that screen until I understood the code underneath it. And I was like, oh, that's the widget, and that's where that thing, yeah. So that screen, I think, could use some user experience thought. And I know Kevin O'Leary has, has devoted a lot of his personal time into designing and redesigning that screen. That, that sounds very exciting. Yeah, um, also, the, the, the media management, because um, really, We've done, there's been so much work done, not only in the Drupal 8 cycle, but the Drupal 7 cycle, and everything that happened in between in order to prepare for mm -hmm. a really good file management implementation, but it's largely a UX problem still. It's like we, there's, there, there's very, it's very difficult to get people to agree on what that experience should be like and um, what, what are all the things that are necessary. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a difficult problem, and I think it's only evidenced by the fact that we're still discussing it. You know, easy problems are, are solved quickly. Yeah, so this is two on the On the plus side, though, with a Drupal 8 site, when you go to the content screen, you not only see a list of content, like, like we did in the past, but you also see a list of files that have been uploaded. And so the system understands files on a level of, like, this is a separate thing. It's not just something that's attached to content. It's not just something that's uploaded in an image field like in the past. It's mm -hmm. actually a, a, a thing that the content management system manages. Yeah, and I think your insight is correct here. That sets us up for experimentation in Contrib if you know, if that's what we're left with um, when we get to a release candidate. So those, uh, I, I, I feel like I may have cut, cut you off on, like, the list of things that you wanted to uh, talk about for Spark, but... So with just a couple of minutes left, I actually have another project that I've been working on that is tangentially related to Drupal and Spark. It's called the Quail Project. I don't know if you've seen me tweet about this. So Quail Like the Bird, working with uh, Kevin Miller, who's um, been involved with the Drupal community. And we are trying to um, take work that he's done over the past half a decade with automated accessibility testing and improve the, I guess, the, the tool chain aspects of it or the, the implementation and the API so that someone could take this project, incorporate it into their web application or website, and get a rundown of the, um, the accessibility of their site against a guideline like the WCAG guideline or the 508 guideline. That would be huge. Huge. Yeah. Because um, the, as, as with many things, the, the, 
one of the largest problems is trying to find where all the problems are. Exactly, and to understand how to prioritize them. And, you know, there's some issues that just need to be addressed immediately, and some that, um, in in the world of you know, you've got limited time and limited resources, but, but can wait a little bit. Is this something that we could theoretically add to our automated testing, like unit tests? So that is my ultimate goal. Uh, the test swarm module has so we have the accessibility module in uh, Drupal Contrib. If you go to project accessibility. That uh, depends on the test form module, and it's taking the Quail library, which is the JavaScript library, and uh, running it against Drupal 8 or Drupal 7 to give a rundown of, I think we had like 200 tests in the previous uh, or in the um, released versions of Quail. And it just gives us a sense of like what theme functions are producing output that um, are inaccessible, or is inaccessible. So, you know, we're, we're kind of in a mode right now where we're working on this project outside of Drupal to uh, improve the APIs and improve the, the tests. But once that effort is done by the middle of the summer, we're going to then switch our attention back to Drupal to reincorporate that. So my, my little group, me and Kevin, we're working with uh, a firm that is contracted with the Dutch government to provide an accessibility testing framework for the, the entire government, every site within the Dutch government um, sphere. So they're building out uh, a search engine implementation and a front end uh, exposure of the data. And we're sort of building that glue in between that does the tests and reports back on cases, you know, fail, pass, and such. Well, it sounds huge, hugely important. Yeah, it's a pretty big project for, for weekends and nights. Um, sometimes it gets my heart racing that we're trying to do this. But at the same time, it has to be done. You know, We can't continue to lean on front-end developers to do this sort of work with only a specification to go by. The specifications are, are too verbose. They're, they're too complicated to understand. And we need to just simply codify those into a testing framework. And it's too dissimilar to how we develop our, our standard process of being mm -hmm. able to debug these kinds of things. You know, not everyone who's working on accessibility issues has the proper kind of tools in order to properly test an accessibility issue. Exactly. I, I hear this thing called JAWS mentioned all the time, and I'm like, I don't want to rent that movie. <laughs> <laughs> what are you talking about? That happened years ago. Yeah, or spend twelve hundred dollars to get the software. Wow, I didn't realize. Yeah, and they don't have a developer version. It's really, it's very sad. It makes it very difficult to develop against um, that platform. Well, Jesse, it's been awesome. Um, it's always awesome talking with you. Um, and that's our show. <laughs> we we have gone through the entire half hour, and I feel like we could talk about um, many more things. But um, thank you for thank coming you. on the show. Hopefully, we can do this again sometime. Yeah, I would love to. All right. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And tune in next week. Um, don't have a show lined up yet, but I'll get right on that. <laughs> All right. Stop broadcast.